Hey there, whether you're part of our church family or a friend tuning in, we love that you are here and pray that you might hear from God today. It is our joy to be able to provide access to teaching, worship, and other resources to equip and train the Church of Jesus. And while we are encouraged for you to benefit from these resources, we ask that they are only supplemental and no way replace a commitment to a gathering and learning within a local church. These resources are gifts of God's grace for people to grow with, but are never meant to replace our belonging to a covenant community of faith. If you'd like to learn more about Center Grove and what we're up to, head to cglife.org and follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Center Grove. And if you'd like to reach out, just simply email info at cglife.org. Now, we pray that God stirs in your heart as you listen to the proclamation of His Word. Hey, good morning. I want to invite you to stand. We're going to begin our time together worshiping, singing to our Savior. And if this is your first time with us in the room, or maybe today you've joined us for the first time online, I just want to say welcome. We are really glad that you've joined us here today. Psalm 118 says, give thanks to the Lord for He is good, His love endures forever. That's our aim, that's our focus today, to lift high the name of Jesus, to give thanks because He first loved us. Let's sing to Him, let's worship Him alone. Come on. You are the God of Abraham.
You're my help, my heal, my blessing, redeem, my answer, my saving.
in our Savior, all glory, honor, strength, and power to your name alone, Jesus, to your name alone. What more can we say, God? We love you. We're a people, a grateful people gathered under one name, under the name, the mighty name, the saving name, the life-giving name of Jesus. So all glory and praise to you alone. You alone are worthy of it. We love you, Lord. Amen. Amen. You guys can take a seat. I don't get to do this very often, but I am uh, glad to introduce to you a uh, special guest here at Center Grove today. Clayton King hails from the uh, great state of South Carolina uh, with a few detours along the way, I think, his excursions into North Carolina and back to South Carolina. Clayton is uh, known to many of you for his work among students, an extraordinary series of camps, books written, and so on and so on. I promised him I would let him introduce himself rather than me introducing him since he knows himself much better than I do. But Clayton, I want to welcome you to Center Grove. This is actually his second time here, way back, way, way back. Uh, I think you said it was in the early 1900s you were here and spoke to some of our youth. I wasn't here, but you were. And so we want to welcome you back to Center Grove. We look forward to what God would share through his word. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Well, it's really good to be back in the great state of North Carolina. I am originally from South Carolina. And in 1991, I became a freshman at Gardner Webb University. So I'm a 1995 graduate. Uh, I think, are you a graduate as well, sir? Two daughters. Two daughters. Okay, so you're in debt to Gardner Webb <laughs> University for the rest of your life. I graduated in 1995 and then attended seminary there until I dropped out, uh, not in protest. I was just a busy guy. I'm married to my lovely wife. Today is our wedding anniversary, actually. Today we celebrate 23 years and 14 days today. Uh, my wife's name is Shari, and she's getting her master's degree right now at Anderson University, which is where we live in Anderson, South Carolina. I'm a pastor at a church down there called New Spring. I'm an evangelist. I was saved when I was 14, and this is now my 35th year in ministry. I started preaching when I had no clue what I was doing. I still don't have much of a clue of what I'm doing. But what I have learned over the years is that bald preachers are the best preachers. <laughs> That is one lesson I've learned, Pastor. It's also an honor uh, to meet your pastor today, living in North Carolina for 23 years in Boiling Springs. After I graduated from school there, we started our nonprofit ministry called Crossroads, and I've uh, been a, a big fan of what God has done here. Also, I think that the year I came and spoke at Center Grove, I believe it was 93 or 94, I came and preached at a student event we went to Moravian Falls. Is that a place? Am I remembering that correctly? We went to a place called Moravian Falls and, and I remember Haley's Comet was coming through. Do you know, any of you remember that? We went out late at night, like at midnight when it would be the darkest and we went out there and saw Haley's Comet come up over the top of, uh, of the Moravian Falls Retreat Center. So that was a long time ago, back in the 1900s when Bon Jovi was still doing rock and roll and um, the Dallas Cowboys were good. Listen, I don't have much time today. We've only got two and a half hours to preach this message. So if you have a Bible, I'm gonna be in Mark chapter five. I invite you to join me there. Mark chapter five. 
While you're turning there, I just want to mention this. I'm very excited. As an evangelist, uh, I love being able to partner with local churches. I love pastors and I love local churches. And one thing I'm very excited about, your students from Center Grove are going to be attending our Crossroads Summer Camps this summer. Uh, This is our 27th year. And uh, ironically, I should say miraculously, after two very difficult years with COVID, uh, we had to cancel our camps. We will have our biggest summer camp ever this summer. We're expecting just under 6,000 teenagers this summer at our summer camps. To God be the glory. Very, very thankful for God's grace and providence. And uh, Adam Hatton, who has been here now for several years, is one of my very best friends on planet Earth. And uh, Adam has been instrumental in helping make that relationship possible. And also, uh, not only are your students going to be coming to our camp this summer, but my beautiful bride and I will be here this fall at Center Grove for a marriage conference. So I hope that all of you will plan to attend that. There'll be more details later. I'm just really honored uh, to be able to partner with such a great church, with such a great legacy of preaching the gospel and making disciples. Well, we're going to be in Mark chapter 5. If you, if you like to take notes, which I do, the title of this message is simply, Faith to Keep Fighting. Faith to Keep Fighting. When I use the word fighting, I'm not talking about people on Facebook. <laughs> I'm not talking about taking sides on an issue. I'm not talking about fighting with political opponents. I'm not talking about uh, one-line zingers that you use with your husband or your wife when you're trying to to get an upper hand in a disagreement or an argument, or as my wife and I call it, intense fellowship. (laughs) It takes faith to continue fighting for intimacy with Jesus, no matter how long you've been a Christian. I've been walking with Jesus now as a believer for 35 years. And I have to tell you honestly, it is both harder and better than I ever dreamed it would be. I wish I could tell you that if you get saved today, and I believe at the end of this message, some of you are gonna give your lives to Christ. I believe when I give an invitation in about 30 minutes from now, that many of you who are close to coming to faith in Jesus are gonna have the Spirit of God draw you to Christ in such an unmistakable way that you're gonna open your heart and instead of being a fan of Jesus, you are going to convert to becoming a follower of Jesus. I understood who Jesus was with my head until I opened my heart to Jesus. And that's what I'm praying for some of you today. But when I opened my heart to Jesus as an eighth grader in, the, uh, in uh, 1987, I didn't know I would have to keep fighting to follow Jesus. I just assumed that when I got saved or became a Christian, everything would fall into place. My life would be easy. I could make A's on tests I didn't study for. I would get the first pretty girl I prayed for God to let me marry. Thank you, Jesus. You did not let me marry some of those girls I prayed for. Oh, the Lord spared me from weeping, wailing, and gnashing of teeth. How many can testify? I prayed that God would give me a Corvette Stingray when I was 15. And because God loved me, he said, no, you're going to drive a yellow 1975 Ford LTD that your mom is going to hand down to you. (laughs) I didn't realize that, that following Jesus would require me to keep fighting for my faith. Now, I do believe that when you come to Jesus and you give your life to Christ, if that salvation is legitimate, if that salvation is real, if that conversion is brought on by the Spirit of God convicting you, you repent of your sin, you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, I believe Romans 10, 13, that when you call on the Lord, you will be saved. I also believe that I didn't just get saved that day and that was the end of it. I believe I am continually being transformed, being sanctified, being formed and shaped into the image of Christ. And I have to fight for that reality or I will, as the Bible would call it, backslide into the things of my flesh. We see in Mark chapter five, a beautiful picture of a woman 
who is, in my estimation, the best example of what it means to fight to get close to Jesus and stay close to Jesus. So I want to start off by asking you a question before we read the scripture. What are you afraid of in your life? What are some things that you fear? Because this woman had fear that she had to fight through to get to Jesus. Now I'll confess to you, I'm not afraid of many things. I'm a, I'm a farm boy. I grew up on a big farm in South Carolina. I'm not afraid to work. I'm not afraid to sweat. I'm not afraid of snakes. I catch them with my bare hands. But I will tell you what I am afraid of, spiders. If you put a spider near me, we will not be friends ever again. I might forgive you in heaven, but not on this planet. I'm also afraid of clowns. I know that doesn't make any sense to many of you, but I, saw, I think I saw it on National Geographic. I'm pretty sure that clowns eat children. I can, I'm so scared of clowns. But there are other things that we're afraid of. I had a conversation with my wife on our anniversary trip this past week, and we were talking about the things that, that we fear. We have two teenage sons. One is 19 years old. He's an evangelist. He preached in Washington, D.C. yesterday, and 25 students gave their lives to Christ. We have a 16-year-old named Jojo. He's a sophomore in high school. He's six foot four, and he runs a 4.5-yard, 40-yard dash. He's going to play football at Clemson University. Or, amen, I knew there were Christians here. Or maybe he'll play basketball at Chapel Hill. I'm not going to touch that one. I know better. I lived here for 23 years. One of the things that we talked about as, as parents, you know the fear that you have as parents is that when your children are born, you begin to imagine all the things that could happen to them, not, even the, not just the good things, but the bad things. You fear that they may make terrible decisions. I just lost a friend recently to cancer. I'll turn 50 in November. There are moments when I fear what would happen to me if I don't take care of my health. What are you afraid of? I want to go ahead and as I open up this passage of Scripture today, I want to let you know that fear is not, is not incompatible with faith. As a matter of fact, they live together in the life of a believer. The phrase I like to use is simply this, faith isn't the absence of fear. Faith is trusting God in the face of fear. 365 times in the Bible, the command is given, do not be afraid. Why would God command us over and over again to fear not if we weren't constantly plagued by some form of fear? And people have figured out that not only are we as humans naturally bent towards fear, but people have figured out that they can build and create algorithms that will play on our fear. And if they can keep us afraid, they can keep us upset, they can keep us polarized, they can keep us at odds, and they can even sell us products that they can make money off of based on our fear. So I wanna let you know as we read this passage from Mark chapter five, your faith in Jesus is a faith that must fight through the fears that will come in your life. So when you are afraid, it doesn't mean you don't know Jesus. It just means that you need Jesus more than ever. And when you are afraid, when I'm afraid, it doesn't mean I'm a bad Christian. It means I'm a real Christian. And I'm a pastor, 35 years in ministry. I confess to you, I still haven't figured out how to fix the problem of fear. But I have seen in the Bible, I can have faith in the midst and I can continue to trust Jesus in spite of the things that cause me to be afraid. Mark chapter five, beginning in verse 25, we read a story about a woman, a beautiful, powerful story that I believe applies to you. If you're a Christian here today, I think you're gonna see yourself in this woman in Mark chapter five. If you're not a believer today, I believe you're gonna see yourself here in this woman in Mark chapter five. And if you're caught in that gray area between the two, you don't know if you're gonna go to heaven or hell when you die, you're not sure if you're saved. Maybe you come from a tradition where you thought that your baptism saved you, but you're not sure. Maybe you were christened or maybe you were baptized as an infant or you were confirmed or you went through classes. I'm not sure what your background is, 
But some of you are in that gray area in the middle. You don't really know if heaven is your home. You're not sure of where your eternity will be spent. This story is for you because you can know. Let me read it to you from Mark chapter five. I'll start off in in verse 25 and we'll go through verse 34. Feel free to look along with your copy of scripture or even up on the screens. Here's what Mark records Jesus saying and doing when he met the woman we're gonna talk about today. Now a woman suffering from bleeding for 12 years had endured much under many doctors. She had spent everything she had and was not helped at all. On the contrary, she became worse. Having heard about Jesus, let me pause there for a moment. This woman had heard rumors about Jesus. This woman had heard the word on the street about Jesus. I've lived in the Carolinas my entire life, all 49 years. And if you have lived in one of the two Carolinas or this area, I call it the buckle of the Bible belt, pretty much everybody in the Carolinas has heard of Jesus. There are lots of rumors about Jesus. The same was true then in this region. She had heard about Jesus, but she had never met him. She'd heard other people talk about what Jesus could do, but Jesus had never done anything for her. That describes some of us. Maybe that describes you today. Your grandma was a Christian. Your grandfather was a Christian. Your parents raised you to believe in God. But what about you? Do you have a real faith? A real true faith in Jesus? Or have you just heard rumors about him? She had heard about Jesus and because of her sickness and condition, She was motivated to fight through the fear to see if Jesus could help her. All right, so the Bible says that she had heard about Jesus. She came up behind him in the crowd and touched his clothing. For she said to herself, if I just touch his clothes, I will be made well. Now the word there for clothes, that's our English word. It means clothing. I think the King James may have used the word raiment as well as a synonym for clothes. But you know that the Bible wasn't written in English. King James did not write the Bible. It was written by multiple men on several continents over the course of 1,500 years, give or take. The word for clothing here is a Hebrew word, kanaf. Now, it doesn't just mean a shirt, a pair of pants, or a dress, or a suit coat. It literally means an outer garment, These were the outer garments that rabbis wore. I've been to Israel nine times. Adam and Jess went with us several years ago. It was a great time. My wife and I are leading another trip to Israel this October. If you go to Israel today, you can still see Jewish men wearing a portion of this clothing. So imagine this outer garment, the clothing she wanted to touch. Why did the woman say to herself, I've lost all my money. I haven't stopped bleeding for 12 years. I have a physical condition that no one can cure or help. I need to get to Jesus. He's coming to my town today. I've heard rumors about him. I need to get there so that not I can pray to him, not that I can honor him with my words. I just need to touch his clothing. That sounds a little weird. I remember seeing clips of the Beatles when they first came over to America. Uh, I remember even when I was a teenager when Michael Jackson would perform a concert and people would literally pass out. My, My mom loved Elvis Presley. And I guarantee you, if my mom could have ever touched his clothing, she would have grabbed a handful of it. So when I think about like this woman wanting to touch Jesus' clothes, I have to ask myself, does she think Jesus is some kind of rock star? No, that's not it at all. She was a Jewish woman. And as a Jewish woman, she knew that rabbis wore an outer garment called a kanaf. And that on the corner of that garment, there were four corners. Imagine like a blanket or a tablecloth with a hole cut out for the head. And just imagine that a rabbi who would have worn this outer garment, the kanaf, would have had four tassels hanging on the corners of the kanaf. Those tassels were called zitz, T-Z-I-T. It was a Hebrew word. Those tassels, if you look in the book of Deuteronomy, are mentioned and they were symbolic of God's covenant love for his people, the Israelites. So this woman who has been praying daily for 12 years for God to heal her 
has wasted all of her money on doctors and nothing has helped her at all. But she knows, I've heard rumors, there is a man coming to my town. And if the rumors I've heard are true, I've got to go see if this man can heal me. Strangely enough, she didn't want Jesus to lay hands on her, to pray for her, to anoint her with oil. I know we're, most of us in here are Baptists, so am I. But anointing with oil was something I grew up with because I grew up as kind of a Christian mutt. My parents were Southern Baptist. I went to a Presbyterian Christian school for 11 years and my grandfather was Pentecostal. Can, can I run that by y'all again? Baptist, Presbyterian, and Pentecostal. You know what that means, right? It means I was predestined to speak in tongues while eating fried chicken and drinking wine at a deacon's meeting. <laughs> now, come on, people, that's funny. I don't care who you are, that's funny right there. You know it is. And I grew up in the Pentecostal tradition with my grandfather. They were anointing people with oil like strangers at a gas station, walking up to them. I feel like the Lord's given me and they put oil. This woman didn't want Jesus to do any of that. She just wanted to grab the corner of his, of his outer garment, his clothing. Well, let me read on and show you what happens and explain why this matters to you. Because this is not just a Bible story. This isn't a Sunday school lesson. This is a message for people like you and me who are broken. People like you and me who struggle. People like you and me who have fear, real fears that we have to fight through to get to Jesus every single day. And I wanna show you what happens because when she said to herself, if I can just touch his clothes, I'll be made well, the Bible says instantly her flow of blood ceased and she sensed in her body that she was healed of her affliction. At once, Jesus realized in himself that power had gone out from him. And so he turned around in the crowd and he said, who touched my clothes? In other words, who grabbed the kanaf? Who was it? The disciples had a pretty obvious response to this, his disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing against you and yet you say, who touched me? In other words, there are people everywhere, Jesus. Everywhere you go, people line up to come see you because of the rumors. Everybody's touching you. Could you be a little more specific? And Jesus knew exactly what he was doing, but he was looking around to see who had done this. The woman with fear and trembling. Don't skip past that. This woman didn't have to buck up and toughen up to come to Jesus. She brought her fear with her. You don't have to figure out all the deep questions of human life and existence to come to Jesus. You don't have to have answers to all the hard questions to follow Christ. I've been a Christian for three and a half decades and I have a lot of questions I wanna ask Jesus. I do. As a matter of fact, I probably have more questions now than when I was a 14 year old kid and I met him for the first time. But I also have more faith now. So I understand that he's God and I'm not. He's sovereign and I am futile and sometimes very broken in my understanding. I know that there are things I'll never understand even when I get to heaven and I'm okay with that. I'm also close enough to Jesus now that I know I can bring my fear to him. I used to pretend like I wasn't afraid and some of us do that. Or my fears and my frustrations would, would, would keep me away from Jesus and I just wouldn't pray for a little while, especially if it was something I didn't understand. But this woman fought through her fear. I'll even take it a step further. It was her fear that motivated her to come to Jesus. I had a conversation Thursday at Rapid Pace Oil Change in Anderson, South Carolina. I have a Ford F-250 because I'm trying to be a man of God. <laughs> and, and it was time to change my oil and I'm having a conversation with the young man who was changing my oil and, he, and I pull in, he goes, hey, you're Clayton King, aren't you? I said, I sure am. He goes, I used to go to your church. I said, what happened? Where are you going now? Did you, or did you find another good church? He's like, no, I don't believe in God anymore. And I always know there's a story there. I said, man, what happened? 
And he told me a story about a family member that was murdered. And this is the question he asked me. He said, if God is a loving God, why would he let something so horrible like that happen to somebody? And we had a good conversation as a result of that. And I said, it sounds to me like you stopped believing in God because there's something you don't understand about how God sovereignly rules over the world he's created. He said, that's right. So I've pushed God away. I'm angry at God. I'm mad at God. And I called him by his name, and in a very gentle, this was not a confrontational conversation at all. I said, can I tell you from my perspective what you've done? You have pushed away the very person that you've needed the most in the last three years to help you through this very difficult loss you've experienced. You don't need to push Jesus away. You need to bring Jesus close. And I said, can I tell you what happened in my life? I lost 10 family members in 12 years. I preached 10 funerals in 12 years of family members. I averaged a funeral about every 16 months for 12 years. I preached my mom's funeral in November of 2010. And then a little over a year later, I preached my dad's funeral on Father's Day after I took care of him for a year and a half as he died with diabetes and heart failure. I know what it's like to be afraid. I know what it's like to be angry. I know what it's like to be angry and confused with God. Have you told God that you're angry and confused with him? He said, no, I don't want God to strike me dead. I'm like, oh, so you do believe in God. <laughs> and he laughed, he goes, you got me. I'm like, no, I don't got anything. What you need is to come back to Jesus. Don't let the fear, the frustration, the anger push you away. God is not offended when you come to him with your questions. He wants you to. I want my children, I got chills on my arms right now. I want my kids to come to me when they don't understand something about God, about life, about women. I've got two teenage boys. They got a lot of questions about 51% of y'all in the room right now. I want them to come to me, even about things I've said and done. I don't want my children to feel pushed away. I don't want my, feel, my children to feel like they can't come to me and my wife and ask us questions. It's the intimacy that I have with my kids that gives them the freedom to come to me when they need something. When this woman comes to Jesus, she came with fear and trembling. She even fell down on the ground. And as she fell down on the ground, she was in the perfect place to receive his grace a place called humility. There is one person that God cannot save. One person. And that is the proud person who will not admit they are broken in need of a savior. The one prerequisite for salvation, Jesus did all the work when he died on the cross. When he shed his blood, we've already sang about it in our worship time today. When he shed his blood, it washed our sins away. And that blood is now available. That forgiveness is available to any woman, any man who will humble themselves and admit they need forgiveness. But when you're too proud to come in a humble posture, Jesus could save you, but he can't save you until you admit that you're lost. This woman was desperate. She was humble. She fought through the fear and when she came to Jesus, it says, let me read the verse again. The woman with fear and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And our last verse in the text, verse 34. Daughter, Jesus said to her, your faith has saved you. Go in peace and be healed from your affliction. We do not know her name, but we know her identity. Jesus called her daughter, and not only did Jesus heal her sickness, he saved her soul. I want to point a few things out to you from this scripture. When I look at this woman, I see this woman was isolated, and this woman was frustrated. 
For her to have a, 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 an issue like this, I wanna be delicate in how I describe it because we don't know exactly what her sickness was, but the fact that she bled for 12 years tells us a few things about her. First of all, she had to isolate because there were rules in Leviticus about anyone who bled, specifically women, you were ostracized from the community for a period of time until you were clean. If you know anything about ancient Judaism, and even today, they still practice laws of cleanliness, things they can and can't eat, things they can and can't do. This woman had to be isolated. It had been a long time since she had known human touch. I remember during the pandemic, I, I was pheasant hunting and I, um, my wife and my two kids got COVID while I was out in South Dakota. And when I came home, I couldn't go in the house. I didn't touch my wife and my kids for like two weeks. I am an extreme extrovert. I'm also a hugger. I hug people, people I don't know because, hey, I wanna get to know you. Come here and give me a hug. And I know some of y'all are like, mm, stranger danger. If I can't touch my wife, if I can't touch my kids, if I can't give them a hug, I feel it. This woman had conceivably not known human touch for 12 years. Can you imagine her frustration? Not only her isolation, can you imagine her frustration? Some of y'all have felt like this before. She had wasted everything she had on cures. Nothing worked. Not one thing worked. Now not only is she sick, but she's broke. I mean, broke is a joke broke. She has nothing. Um, about in October, what was that, seven, eight months ago? Um, I got really sick. Long story short, I had appendicitis. My appendix ruptured inside of my body. Because of COVID, it took them eight hours to get me into surgery. I got sepsis. I almost met the Lord. It's the closest I've ever come to death other than being bombed on the border of Pakistan in 1998. That'll be another story for another sermon, Pastor. I got really close to meeting the Lord. I'm still paying, even though with health insurance, I'm still paying the deductible, and I'm frustrated about it. I was frustrated at the medicine they gave me. They saved my life. But I, there were so many little frustrations, most of them with my own body. I cannot imagine what she felt like. 12 years, what was her issue? Was it a chronic nosebleed? Was she a hemophiliac? Was it a bleeding ulcer? We don't know, but I also know this, she was weak. When you bleed for 12 years, you don't have the energy to get up out of bed. I don't, I've never had a, an issue with that, but I remember the first time I gave blood. I can't give blood anymore because I lived in Africa for a semester when I was at Gardner-Webb and I caught malaria, so I can't give blood ever again. But don't worry, it's not contagious within 200 yards. So I'm kidding, it's not, I can't make jokes like that. My wife told me to quit making that joke. Malaria is not contagious. <laughs> Let me make sure I say that. First time I ever gave blood in high school, I, we had a blood drive and I went to the library at our school to give blood. And the nurse said, Clayton, did you eat breakfast this morning? I'm like, I don't need to eat breakfast. I'm, I'm country. I'm big and strong. She's like, you probably should eat some cookies and juice. We have some over there. Blood sugar. She starts trying to explain it to me. I'm like, I'm good. I'm from the West side. And she's like, no, you really need to. Don't worry about it. I woke up about an hour later, covered up with her like lab coat on a couch in the, in the library at Hillcrest High School because just losing one pint of blood, blood is rich in iron, it oxygenates your cells, it, it, you can't function without it. She had continued to lose blood for 12 years. Can you imagine how isolated, frustrated, and weak this woman was? Does it relate to you? Can you relate to that? Because we all tend to think we're strong until the thing that we have put our faith in and idolized begins to diminish. Anybody check their stock portfolio in the last year? The things that we think make us strong. Anybody ever had a sickness that you couldn't heal from? A wayward child that you raised better? You're making decisions now and you can't fix it or figure it out? You know what you need? Jesus a touch from Jesus, closeness with Jesus, a relationship with Jesus. 
All it takes is a little bit of faith. All it takes is enough faith to, to fight to get to him. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to clean your life up. Bring your busted life to Jesus. Bring your frustration to Jesus. She is the example that we all need to follow because she came just like she was and Jesus did not tell her, oh, you filthy, dirty woman, you're unclean. Jesus did not say, go back to your home and isolate because you are not allowed to be around people. Haven't you read Leviticus? No, she had not read Leviticus, but she had read Malachi 4.2. What does Malachi 4.2 say? She had read Malachi 4.2. Here's what Malachi 4.2 says. But for you who fear my name, the son of righteousness shall rise with healing in his wings. What does that have to do with her story? Well, I wanna explain this to you. In Malachi 4.2, the word used there for wings, when I think about the word wings, I think about the wings of an airplane, I think about wings on a bird, or I think about wings I eat when I'm watching college football. But that word wing right there simply means sides. And guess what that word is in Hebrew? Kanaf. When the son of righteousness appears, he shall rise with what? Healing in his wings. If this, look, look, if this woman had prayed one time a day for 12 years for God to heal her, she would have prayed 4,820 times. If she had prayed five times a day, five times a day, God, please heal me of my bleeding. She would have prayed 21,900 prayers that were unanswered. Simple math, 21,900 prayers. You think she was frustrated? You think she was upset? But did she give up? No, she didn't quit. She got to Jesus. And when she gets there, I believe she was praying Malachi 4.2. I believe when she humbled herself and got on the ground and crawled toward Jesus, that Malachi 4.2 is playing in the background of her mind. If I can just grab the kanaf, the tassel. Why would she wanna grab the tassel? Because that's where the healing was, in the kanaf. She reached up in faith. Now I'm an author, I just finished my 18th book. When I was working on my 17th book called Reborn, I was writing a chapter about this woman and I'm sitting on the couch in my house and I'm reading all of this for the first time about the kanaf and about the tassels that hung from the corners and how they had healing and power and anointing and and they weren't just for decoration, They they had real true power in the mind of every Israelite. And I'm reading about this woman and, and, the, and the scholar that wrote this commentary says, she grabbed, reached up and grabbed one of those tassels from the corner of his kanaf. And I'm sitting on the couch surrounded by pillows because I'm married to a woman. We have pillows. We keep Pottery Barn in business with pillows. We have 1,212 pillows at my house. I can lay my head on two of them. The rest of them, they just, they, they just sit there and they look cute and I'm not allowed to touch them unless I'm organizing them and fluffing them and hitting them in the middle so that little crease in the middle makes them look. You know what I'm talking about, women. I'm not one of you, but I am married to one of you, so I understand a little bit. And I'm looking at this pillow and seriously, I'm like, are there any tassels on the corner of this pillow? There are. I look down and there are four tassels on the corner of this decorative pillow that cost $400. So I look around to make sure my wife's not in the room, make sure she's not watching. I reach over and I grab that tassel and I yank it and I pop it right off the corner of that pillow. (laughs) And I tell myself, this is gonna be a great visual aid. This tassel, is not the one from my wife's pillow. I have full disclosure, it's 6.30 a.m. this morning, I'm texting Adam Hatton, I'm like, Adam, I left my tassel at the house. Can you sneak around and see if Jess has any pillows that you can rub a tassel off of? And two minutes later, he sends me a picture of this one. There's nothing powerful about this tassel. It's the faith it took that woman to believe a promise God had made in the Bible. That's what motivated her to reach up and take hold. Is that you today? Isn't it time that you come to Jesus with all of your doubts and all of your frustrations and all of your fears 
Because all you have to do is get there. Just open your heart to him. Just ask him to save you. Ask him to come in. And you know what he'll do? He'll call you daughter. He'll call you son. He'll not only heal your sickness, he'll take away your sin and he'll give you a brand new life. All you have to do is have enough faith to grab it. I'm not up here to just give you a Bible study. I want you to make a decision. So I want you to close your eyes and open your hearts right now. Whoever you are and wherever you are in life, I wanna ask you, do you need to take Jesus by faith today? With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, hearts open, if you are ready to cross that line of faith, to stop wondering and doubting whether or not you're gonna go to heaven or hell when you die, to nail it down, remove the doubt, and know for sure that you belong to Jesus. All you have to do is take him by faith and call on his name. If you ask him into your life, he will save you. You can do that right now. If you wanna pray and receive Christ, if you are ready to take your first step of faith, bring all your questions, bring all your doubts, bring all your fears, that stuff will take care of itself in time. But the first step is you've gotta invite him in to save you. And if you wanna do that, pray this to Jesus right where you sit. He's listening. In your heart, pray this to him. Jesus, I need you to save me. So I believe in you. I put my faith in you. I trust you. I repent of my sin and I invite you in. Take my fears and my doubts and make me a new person. I'm all yours, Jesus, and I'm all in. Now with your eyes closed and your hearts open, I'm gonna ask a simple question. If you just prayed that prayer to Jesus and you meant it, young or old, atheist, agnostic, Baptist, Methodist, doesn't matter. If you just prayed that prayer to Jesus and you grabbed hold of him by faith, would you do something? Eyes closed, but hearts open. Would you just raise your hand straight up above your head right now? If you just prayed that prayer to Jesus, keep it up, please. I'm not gonna make you do anything, but I am gonna, I wanna see your hand. Keep it up for just a moment. Nobody's looking, but I'm looking. I'm gonna count hands. Can you keep them up, please? You're gonna be amazed at this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, can you keep your hands up for a second? 18 people have just responded to the gospel. Eight, 19, 19 people have just responded to the gospel. You can put your hands down. I'm gonna ask everybody to open your eyes and look at me for a moment. First of all, 19 people just prayed to receive Christ right here in this room. Holy cow. Thank you, Jesus. Now you know who you are and I don't ever wanna embarrass anyone. But 19 people just put their faith in Jesus Christ. Holy cow, God is good. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna, I hope this is okay, Pastor. I'm gonna ask you to do something. We had planned to end the service a different way. The band's about to lead a song. But I'm just gonna ask, there is no shame in the gospel of Jesus Christ, Romans 1 for it is the power of God for salvation. I'm gonna invite the 19 of you that just prayed to receive Christ. Eyes are open, lights are on, we're all looking. Some of them were kids, some of them were teenagers, most were adults. This is gonna be crazy. And if nobody stands up, I guess I blew it. But I believe somebody right now that just nailed down their faith in Jesus is ready to say, I just gave my life to Christ and I'm not ashamed. Standing up doesn't save you, Jesus saves you. And if you just got saved, you have the faith to stand up. And I'm gonna count to three. When I say three, if you just prayed to receive Christ, I'm gonna ask you to stand up. I didn't plan to do this, but I'm gonna scrap my notes and go with the ghost. You gonna do it? We're all gonna see you do it. And we're gonna lose our minds and celebrate. Like our favorite team just won the NCAA basketball championship. Better than that, because this is more important than Duke or Carolina or NC State for that matter. 
One, here we go, here we go, here we go. Let's go, let's do it right now. Two, <laughs> praise the Lord. Three, if you just prayed to receive Christ, would you stand up? Would you stand up? Stand up right now. Praise God, stand up and don't sit. Don't sit, stand up, stand up. I was waiting on you. Praise God, come here, man, praise the Lord. I was waiting on you. I was waiting on you. Just stay standing. Woo! Praise God. Anybody else? Stay standing. Stay standing. Stay, don't sit. Don't sit. Please don't sit. Please don't sit. Please don't sit. Please don't sit. Get back up. Come on, get back up. I'm going to ask everybody that's standing right now. You can take a friend with you. You can take a family member with you. We've got some of our pastors. Adam, can you wave? We've got some of our pastors. They want to talk to you right now. So I'm gonna ask those of you, to, we already know who you are and we love you. You're in the family now. No embarrassment, no shame. You love Jesus. You just gave your life to Christ. Would y'all please take a friend with you if you want to. Would y'all walk right over here to where Adam is? Just go right now. Just go right now. You can take your baby. He's waving at me. He just waved at me. Your baby just waved at me. Just walk right over here. Some of our pastors here at Center Grove wanna talk to you about your next step. Just go ahead and go right now. Can we celebrate everybody that's responding right now? Just go ahead and walk right over there. Wow. Oh my goodness. Okay, Lord Jesus, thank you for what you just done. I'm sorry I went three minutes late, but not really. Thank you for the people that just gave their lives to you, Jesus, and for the miracle of salvation. And now, Lord, we're gonna get up on our feet. That's your cue, everybody get up on your feet. Now, Lord, we're gonna sing and we're gonna celebrate the power of the gospel in Jesus' name, amen.
I had been uh, praying for four people especially, and uh, I just have to confess my lack of faith to see God work, and I'm so grateful. Did you know there was 18 people got up in the morning and had no idea? Had no idea. They would grab hold of a tassel. Probably did not get up thinking about a tassel this morning. I love to be where God is working. I love to see Him working. And I love to be reminded that He does not stop. He does not stop. Always working. Always showing His truth in the lives of people and always reaping. Always giving us a reason to bless Him and praise His name. I'm grateful. I'm supposed to be doing announcements now. But I want to preach, but he's already had to confess he went three minutes over to Jesus. I never had a three-minute problem. They all wish I had a three-minute problem. But I keep working with them. But anyway, all right, so here are the announcements, just two of them. Two big events coming this summer for kids and students. One is Summer Adventure. Registration begins today. Summer Adventure is June 20 to 24. If you would like to volunteer, we have openings for volunteers to serve, but we'd love for you to register your third, your three-year-old to your fifth grader. Let us know they're coming. It'll be in the evening this year. They'll have a great time of learning about Christ, spending time together, building healthy relationships, growing in their, in their faith, pursuing faith. For students today, uh, July 22nd to 26th, we'll be making our journey to Crossroads Camp that Clayton uh, provides in Boiling Springs, Boiling Springs, North Carolina, Gardner-Webb University. We'd love for you to register your kids. You can go right over and register your teenagers for uh, Crossroads at Next Steps. There is a tent, a tarp for summer adventure. You probably saw when you came in. All right, we're going to close with a word of prayer and we're gonna pray for those who made decisions and uh, we're gonna pray as well for the next service because there are some folks who are on their way to church right now that need to find a tassel. Amen? All right, let's pray. Would you pray for them, those that are coming that need Christ? need to find that tassel. Now would you pray for those who need to push through their fear to find Jesus? Father God, would you Put your hand upon the service that is to come as Jesus tarries, and would you do yet again a fresh work? And Father God, for believers present in this room and who will be present in the next, grant us a fresh resolve, even in the face of fear, to push through to Jesus, knowing, believing, trusting that He is all we need, has all we need to have, promises all we need to, to hear promised to us. Keep us pressing through to Christ, fighting to be where He is, for He is all we need. We pray and ask it in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Go in grace. Thanks again for listening. If you'd like to dig deeper into this message, you can access a discussion guide right where you found this message, either on the website or the Center Grove app. Also, head to cglife.org to learn more about Center Grove, what we're up to, and access even more resources. 
Thanks again for opening God's Word with us today. We hope that you've been encouraged and challenged to walk deeper in relationship with Him.